Welcome. Let's get started. This is the second session on the third day, uh, what I have been calling the Dion Brand Festival. Um, we're gonna get right to it. We have arranged closed captioning for this webinar. If you would benefit from closed captioning, please bring your mouse to the bottom of the screen and select live transcript. This event is also being live streamed on our YouTube channel and is available. There should be a link in the chat. We encourage you to use the hashtag map at 20 to share your reactions and comments on social media. We begin with marking the violent histories of where we are, with making note of and reminding us of the ongoing conflicts and contradictions of this land, this water, this air. This land is the territory of the Hur Huron, Wendat, and Petun First Nations, the Anishinaabe, the Mississaugas of the Credit River, and the nation of the Haudenosaunee. The meeting place of Toronto remains home to indigenous people from across Turtle Island. These Americas are built on violence and erasure, and we bring these histories with us. Those native to this land, indigenous people from other territories, as well as white settlers by conquest, and some of those of us who came here by force or otherwise as a result of slavery, colonialism, and imperialism, and ongoing wars. When we enter any room, even or especially virtual rooms like these, we must bring these histories into view. This acknowledgement is particular to Toronto, the location of York University and the host, to, the host of a map to the door of no return at 20, a gathering. But we were meeting together virtually from countries around the world, each with its own history of conquest with settler colonialism, slavery, imperialism and ongoing wars. And we must also acknowledge and bring those histories and presence into view. It is with this knowledge we enter and meet here in the hopes of making a different world. So welcome again to this, our third session, our second session on the third day of this gathering, Map of the Door No Return at 20. I'm going to introduce the first speaker. I am going to try and stay out of the way and offer no commentary or anything of the sort. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Warren Critchlow, who is Associate Professor at York University, Toronto, where he teaches cultural studies and education. He is a co-editor of Race, Identity and Representation in Education, Routledge from 1993 and republished in 2005. Tony Morrison in the curriculum, a special issue of the journal Cultural Studies in 1995 and spaces of new colonialism, reading schools, museums, and cities in the tumult of globalization, 2020. He is the author of Baldwin's Rendezvous with the 21st Century, I Am Not Your Negro, and co-author of A Grand Panorama, Isaac Julian, Frederick Douglass, and Lessons of the Hour. Those are recent essays in Film Quarterly. His current project is a co-edited book on intersections of education and architecture in the prose fiction of W.G. Sibalt, tentatively titled On Settling Complacency, Hope and Ethical Responsibility, which is in progress. The title of Warren's talk today is Prodigious Presence After the Door of No Return. Warren? I'm just going to share my screen for a moment. Um, <clears throat> Hey, I hope the uh, the screen is shared. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Just lost my text. OK. 
Okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you for the uh, introduction, Ronaldo. I am, of course, pleased and honored uh, for the invitation to celebrate MAP's 20th anniversary publication. Numerous literary scholars have deeply conjugated this extraordinary 2001 intertextual, almost intermedial, constitutively relational autobiographical prose work, explicating more broadly Dion Brandt's massive ongoing impact over the decades as a path-breaking poet, novelist, provocateur of black letters, a generous teacher, a, a public intellectual, a gift to Canada, uh, to the city of Toronto, and to literature writ large. Here I will tangentially supplement such abundant acclaim indirectly. My provisional remarks are titled, A Prodigious uh, Presence After the Door of No Return. It's now 21 years into the 21st century. Little has changed except the planet is more degraded and the social world more ruthlessly disenchanted. Nevertheless, bright shimmers emerge from historical memory. With encountering Dion Brand, one of the most memorable. At the time I resided in Toronto nearly six years and much of what happened that night blurs from memory. We were nearing the end of September 2001, Friday the 28th to be exact, 17 days after 9-11. The Western world powers were reeling and, and an intolerable senseless retribution uh, would soon multiply and continue to afflict the globe until this present moment. On that particular night, however, Toronto's women's uh, bookstore, which is now defunct, and upsurge uh, media, along with community radio stations, CKLN and CIUT, hosted a book launch party for Dion Brand's A Map to the Door of No Return, Notes on Belonging. Doubleday Canada, a Brand's publisher, enthusiastically endorses her firmly established international reputation on the invitation advertising card, inviting all to the Rivoli, to the Revelle Club at 368 uh, College Street. Spoken word, live jazz, no doubt a reading from Dion in the distinctive cadence of her voice were part of the evening's celebratory agenda. I am reminded of these minute details uh, from the small invitation card stashed among other memorabilia in the hardback copy of the book purchased that night. I am at least certain the book was published, a uh, purchase that night because it is autographed by Dion directly under the book's subtitle, Notes to Belonging. Uh, its inscription is to my partner, Cass Banning, written for Cass, love and friendship, clearly signed, dated 2809-01. The ink is blue, Analgesic blue, blue violet, blue axe, vein blue book, the blue clerk. At a book signing table, I visualized Dion's inky cursive uh, inventing countless inscriptions that night, all, gener all uh, with generosity, sincerity, and a deeply felt solidarity furnished by a flourish of individuated penmanship. 20 years on, I return to <clears throat> a map of the door of no return, a map to the door of no return. I'm reminded of Brand's 2001 Crystal Lecture, an autobiography of the autobiography of reading, that a map also, at a map also leads with an indefinite article, repetition of the indefinite article between the roughly two, 20 years that separate these two works is no doubt integral to Brand's inimical uh, prose style and inscrutable attentiveness to the performative play of language. Beyond all destinations, arrivals and departures, the indefinite signals conscious recognition of the journey's ongoingness, literary and otherwise, as well as the complicatedness of a writing and political life's peripatetic itinerary with living in relation. Leading with, the leading with the indefinite, Brand explains in autobiography, 
signifies subjective openness to the possibility of multiple autobiographies, numerous itineraries, deferrals, compounded situations of subjectivity, other lives, each its own imprecise genealogy. At the same time, precarity and uncertainty, as Brand underscores repeatedly, are never singular or individual facts of experience, never uncoupled from increasing uh, and collective forms of vulnerability normalized in the world. The long durée of history with its increasing pressures placed on the work of simply living, particularly if one is black. Here in the interminable aftermath of dispersal, composing an autobiography of black reading, like bringing a map to a place like the, the door of no return is complicated by conditions of coloniality that construct how the course is possibly navigated, how today's disposable modernity is extracted from and then re-etched on the body. Here Brand reminds me of the well-worn Marxist phrase, histories are made, but not as one plead, uh, not, not as one pleases. Needed in her word craft, however, Brand's formulation uninhibited neither by rage nor ruthless, nor the ruthlessness of coloniality's normative refusals of black bodily futurity gets directly to the heart of the matter. Quote, outsides and insides, worlds to be chosen, disturbed, interpreted and navigated in order to live something like a real self, unquote. The door and the autobiography both also mobilized a definite article. Again, Brand is exacting, exactingly purposeful uh, in her usage. She writes, quote, the definite article of the second, uh, the clause uh, of the autobiography identifies the subject who is supposed to be made, unquote. Here there is as much fundamental concern for textual form as for among other affects, both ontological and epistemological, a working through of colonial pedagogies that hide imperatives and other dehumanizing relations of the colonial event. Structural events that repeatedly render bi a biographical situation decidedly absent, as a place is, as a geography is, perpetually unnamed, disappeared, declared already mythic. Both works communicate a critical, nagging sense of displacement from a traceable beginning, a name to call on, a place from where one's ancestors departed, and beyond the imaginary, a potential for return while always in the middle of a journey whose unnameable familiarity troubles. Quoting the cartographic scholar David Turnbull, Brand, Brand reflects on the likelihood that successfully finding one's way is not guaranteed by solely having a map also required is a, co a cognitive schema, as well as practical mastery of wayfinding. Where does one find such a schema? One that assures success when the destination is not a place itself, but a metaphor for a place. More than a method of recovery or recuperation, a map to the door of no return strikes me as a meditation, a chant, a, 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 chant, a chant in fact, on living in and with the diaspora, however scattered and mythic, however made, but still a new world in the making. In this sense, I liken Brand's Rahilla, a traveler's tale, an account of, privilege, of, of, of pilgrimages to a radical form of psalm, a sacred song, a love supreme. It sings of and risks, it sings of and to risks of living without a, without, of living without a banister in relation to others, a world whose history, as James Baldwin described it, is longer, larger, more various, more beautiful, and more terrible than anything anyone has ever said about it. That is, before Brand's fearless oral rudder, long poems that began to say more, to say it differently than it had been said, memor mem memoryless and tough with remembrances, heavy with lightness, aching with grins. Uh, Julie Meritu, Home Relations Unfold, interacting with the aggressive, forceful nature of history. 
Brand's map, map making entails imagination and wonder wrought from scouring ancient cartographic discourses as all manner of fictions and shards of self-serving desire. Non-linear, indeed anti-linear, an anti-linear atlas uh, is constructed attentive to disparate sounds, languages, and images, places known and unknown, and sleepless nights induced. She draws from disorientation, from the disorientation of travel, arrival, and departure, finds significance in a window falling shut, fragments of impressions discerned in darkened doorways, or in being dumbfounded by children at play in a small village on the summit of a silent volcano. She listens for whispers and hears music that disinherits answers. Her craft is exquisitely memorist, building and assembling from any wisp of a dream of evidence, her own and those who have passed through. Verso 40.5, Blue Clerk. Summary. There is a photo of Monk and Nellie and Coltrane it is not possible for me to describe the 500 years it took to record this image. In my reading, the map, the relational work of finding one's way autobiographically or cartographically to belonging after the door of no return predicates neither on locating a final creation place nor beginnings. Rather, I'm struck by the idea of exploration of curiosity about the journey itself, mapping the journey as, as a still moving site of navigational belonging. In the final map, stanza five, Brand brings this insight home for me with elegiac concision. Quote, to travel without a map, to travel, uh, travel without a way, they did long ago. That misdirection became the way after the door of no return. A map was only a set of impossibilities, a set of changing locations. Misdirection became the way. A thought lingered as I reread this generative passage just a few weeks ago while staying in a century and a half old farmhouse located two hours north of Toronto. While taking my warning, taking my daily constitutional on a dusty rural road, I am struck by the surrounds uncanny familiarity with Dan's description of Pinnery and Concession Roads, where she once found herself marooned in the mouth where things escape before they are said. All around me is forest, except for one side. There is an open field of drying corn stalks awaiting late fall harvest. What am I doing out here? <laughs> what am I doing out here? I do not know, Brand recalls. I mean, in a sense, I didn't know I would end up here. My own locale is a parallel universe. There is a mailbox across the road with a broken red flag. It, re it remains inert. I do, not expect, I do not expect any mail. When you travel, as Brand does, you travel, you travel, uh, when you travel, as Brand does, you travel with, ev with everything. It goes with you, even the things you do not know. A set of impossibilities, changing locations. It is another time, a different, a different set of circumstances, 20 years later. Unlike Brand, I do not dread the place. I do not fear the people but I do wonder about them. I walk the road, a pickup truck passes every now and then, a driver, usually male, waves, our gaze, our gazes meet. I wave back as road dust kick, kicks up. I look out on the land amazed by the mystery. Great ring, winged birds pass overhead, skimming the tops of scrub pines and cast long shadows. Perhaps the difference is one of gender. Perhaps it is not quite the dead of winter. Still, like Brand, the thought arises. What am I doing out here? I do not know. I mean, in a sense, I did not know I would end up here. A set of impossibilities, changing locations. Whose land is this, I wonder? 
the public schools of, of what is now called Nadawasaka acknowledge the territory, the traditional land of Anishinaabe people, including the Ojibwe, Adawa, the Potawatomi nations, collectively known as the Three Fires Confederacy. But what did the land look like then, now so domesticated by so many years of, er of erasure by settlement, of so many years of bad faith? Walking, I come to a 19th century farmhouse, collapsing into ruin. Still, it is beautiful. Inside, among the dusty remains of late night uh, teen gatherers and graffiti, I see scrawled on the wall, hashtag BLM. Way out here, I am surprised with wonderment. A map begins to form itself uh, to this psychic destination, this intermediate textual port of call, of belonging, at which I, we arrive if only temporarily, 20 years into the 21st century, I keep walking. I just wanna uh, stop the share for a minute and come back to it with just a very short clip of a video I made of, of that walk. Uh, let's see. a little bit so it's not so long. So I walk. Thank you. <clears throat> Next up. Uh... <clears throat> Next up, we have Biko Mandela Gray, who is assistant professor of religion at Syracuse University. His teaching and research are on the relationship between blackness, ethics, and philosophy of religion. The title of Biko's presentation is The Religion of the Door, Map as Mythology. Biko? Thank you, Ronaldo, and thank, uh, I wanna thank everyone who organized this. Um, this is an amazing gathering and I echo the sentiments that Ronaldo gives in terms of being the Dion Brand Festival that brought a, a smile to my face. Um, for reasons that hopefully will become clear, the title of the paper ended up shifting. Uh, and so <laughs> the title ended up being Feudal Plans, Map, Wandering, and the Study of Religion. And I begin with an epigraph, a kind of edited epigraph from the text. This roadmap was to be my itinerary. I had planned, I had planned, I had planned, I had planned. I had planned to discuss the religion of the door. Quote, perhaps the door of no return is the holy grail of the, of the diaspora. Transform us into full being through its immutable knowledge transform us into being, unquote. I had planned to describe a map to the door of no return as a religious pilgrimage. Quote, I will fly over the door of no return. I cannot help thinking, at least I know where I am going. I am going willingly, unquote. I had planned to describe a map, I'm sorry, I had planned to dwell on map as myth. Quote, you are therefore already mythic unquote. I had planned to announce maps critical and constructive possibilities for the study of religion. I am not religious, quote, but I do, but this I do each time I am at the ocean, unquote. 
I made these plans because I am nervous about being here. I am nervous because I'm still finding my way in Black studies. I am nervous because MAP deserves care and I am unsure of myself. Being nervous guided my plans, set my itinerary, and I would therefore determine the destination in advance. I begin in MAP and end at the study of religion. If you study religion, this of course makes sense. In religion, we are trained to map worlds, our worlds, other worlds, their relations. Jonathan Z. Smith, one of the most influential scholars in religion, uh, once put it this way, quote, what we study when we study religion is the variety of attempts to map, construct, and inhabit positions of power through the use of myths, rituals, and experiences of transformation, unquote. Though map is not territory, Smith claims, he nevertheless concludes that, quote, maps are all we possess, we being the scholars um, of the study of religion. Often forsaking the territory for the map, the study of religion is consumed by cognitive schemas, whether they be our own or others. So we set out, ready to make our pictures and draw our lines. We leave and we arrive. Knowing this, I set out to show how map disrupts this cartographic desire, this cognitive thirst for captive map making. Traveling with map speaker, I began scanning the territory of the text for its critical interventions from beyond the door. Which is to say, I set out to mobilize map's blackness as a centerpiece of and mouthpiece for my critique of religious studies. This was my itinerary. These were my plans. But plans fail. Geography is irony. I had made plans, but I am not here to execute them. I am here to testify. I had written two other papers. They are still on my computer, open. But there were these lines I could not shake in the text. Quote, it is life you must write about. It is life you must insist on, unquote. A map to the door of no return insists on life. I was insist on life and I was not insisting on life. I was creating categories. I was doing the very thing I'd set out to critique. Re religious pilgrimage was my own cognitive schema. The door as myth was my cartographic construction. And not only this, I had territorialized the blackness of the text, framing it as the preeminent terrain of critical inquiry. In my nervousness, I had planned to make pilgrimage and myth and territory the hermeneutic skeleton keys to the text. They would be my tools for unlocking the text's meanings. They failed me. Not because they aren't there, but because they cannot be instrumentalized in the text. Map does not traffic an instrumental reason. The insights it offers are irreducible to, uti to utilitarian use value. Map eludes interpretation. It cannot be pinned down. It resists comprehension. It cannot be grasped. Map is therefore what philosopher of, of black religion Victor Anderson might call a grotesque text. It does not try to resolve ambiguity or what we might call contradiction. It does not preoccupy itself with congruity or coherence. It is indifferent to categorical distinctions between map, maps, and territories, preferring neither as it wanders through space and time and their ruptures. Wanders, yes. To me, map wanders. More precisely, map commits to wandering. It is steadfast in its refusal of origins and destinations. The door is real and imaginary and imagined. She has not seen it, but it is on her retina. As such, she wanders through places and times, guided by misdirection, resting in failed plans and stunted itineraries. She is disappointed by her papa's forgetting, but she eventually suggests that, quote, perhaps forgetting is all to the good, unquote. Map commits to wandering, and in this commitment, the text resists, it eludes interpretation. Map's hermeneutic elusiveness nullifies, or at least mitigates, the cartographic desire dominating much of the study of religion. It does not reverse the relationship. It does not prefer the territory to the map. 
Yes, geography is irony. Locative techniques, whether they are itineraries or pictures, carry no weight here. But map doesn't prefer territory either. Topography is useless when where you come from doesn't exist, when it, quote, shouldn't exist, unquote. Territory is not the thing is not a thing to the one who is, quote, running out of the world. What I'm trying to get at here is that map is unmappable. And in its unmappability, map gestures towards something more generative than cartography, cartography and its critique. Map generatively and painfully and capaciously and joyously and angrily and mournfully commits to wandering as a method. Nomadic movement pays no heed to categorical distinctions and sterile abstractions. You cannot map what will not sit still. You cannot chart the path of the wayward. Beyond the door, which is to say beyond the ontological, epistemological, categorical, and social point of no return, one is bereft of the stability of origins and destinations. Beyond the door, misdirection must become your way. Nothing else will do. Quote, that misdirection became the way, unquote, she writes. I suspect this is the case. I, says, I suspect this is the case because the text so keenly and unwaveringly focuses on life. But there is a difference between focus and romance. Map doesn't superimpose the cognitive schemas of, vic, of, of either triumphant romance or overdetermined victimhood onto life. Paying, quote, paying attention to faces to the unknowable, unquote, map tracks life in its complexity. Encountering precocious kids who play school and ask unanswerable questions. Finding reprieve from the violence of naming or misnaming in smoke-filled poetry bars. Waking up at 4.45 in the morning and reading difficult literature. And drinking with unsettled colleagues who nervously await and, and ride punctual trains. Map recalls dinners filled with absurd laughter and celebrations preceding mass violence. It rests in the grotesquerie of a non-religious woman enacting ablutions, ritual ablutions, to reason with and give thanks to Yemaya. Map beholds the unbearable porosity of black bodies as they are entered and exited by nearly everyone. Map wanders. It commits to wandering. It adopts wandering as a method. And it does so because it is committed to life. Quote, it is life you must write about. It is life you must insist on, unquote. And life beyond, and life beyond the door is unmappable. I had planned to talk about map and religion. I had planned to provide a critique of religious studies by mapping map. But those lines undid my plans. Those lines in that text undid me. I was exposed. And in my exposure, I realized if, quote, what we study when we study religion is the variety of attempts to map, unquote, then perhaps we have to realize that, quote, a map is only a life of, a, of conversations about a forgotten list of irretrievable selves, unquote. Map encourages scholars of religion to adopt wandering as a method. Perhaps in that wandering, we will displace our thirst for clarity and transparency, for congruity and coherence, which is to say, if we wander, we might be transformed. Or at least that's what happened to me. I had planned to talk about map and religion, but map undid me and my plans. And for that, I wash my hands, throw water into the air and see and give thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Biko. Thank you, Warren. Um, next speaker up is Alyssa Trotz. Alyssa Trotz teaches in Caribbean Studies and Women and Gender Studies at the University of Toronto and is affiliate faculty at the University of the West Indies Cave Hill campus. She's the editor of The Point to, is to Change the World, Selected Writers of Andaye, and for the last 13 years has edited a weekly newspaper column titled In the Diaspora in Guyana's Starbuck News. 
the title of Alyssa's talk today, A Whole World Was In Their Face, Honoring Places Beyond Maps. Alyssa? Thank you. Thank you, Ronaldo. And I'd like to thank Christina Sharp, Andrea Davis, and all the organizers for this um, incredible set of conversations. And just to say I'm deeply humbled by the invitation to join in this wonderful celebratory engagement with Dion Brand's maps. Halfway through map, we find ourselves in Calabishi, on Dominica's northeastern coast and in Kalinagua territory where the shopkeeper sees Brand, by which I mean he affirms her as part of the community. Of his daughter, Brand remarks that a whole world was in her face. Quote, 3,000 3, years of Sibini, then Arawak, then Carib. In her face, all the battles against the French and English. In her face, now African. Which people? Ga, Ashanti, Igbo, washed in, wept in, end quote. The Kalinago man who Dion tells us looks me in the eye as if he knows me, brings to mind the title of Nadine King Chambers' remarkable essay, When Two Eyes Meet, the, end, the Lie Ends. In her moving meditation that conjoins settler and plantation colonialism across Canada and the Caribbean, Chambers opens with a poem by Haitian Canadian Junie Desil. These lines in which intergenerational knowing is shared at the kitchen table through the outstretched palm of a Haitian grandmother, woman's work, like the old peasant woman ritually sweeping the sand from under her house who captures Kamau Braffitt's tidalectic imagination. The lines etched on my face, my hands, are the history of our people, she says to me. Grandma traces her story with my fingers, dragging my index across the deepest brown line in her palm. A map that begins with Anacoana, the 15th century Taino cacique of the Americas through the door of no return with the latest line in her grandmother's palm leading to Montreal where the poet, the granddaughter lives. In my reflections on black diasporic life today, I want to stay close to the sensation produced by the Kalinago elders affirmation of brand in one swift glance at her face and in turn Brand's recognition of his daughter, her sister, a gesture so ordinary you almost weep with relief. We can treat these as separate experiences, as multiple solitudes, but there is a different cartography at work here. Lines on a palm, a furrowed brow, where our bodies tell us something different, offering a sensual map without, as Toni Morrison puts it, the mandate for conquest. Different and intertwined is the language that Nishnabeg writer Leanne Simpson drew upon in her luminous response to maps that was posted yesterday, like intricate stories of land woven into the baskets from the black ash tree. Through five threads that seek to explicate the stakes for us today, extractivism, elisions, not extinction, enactments, ecologies, and entanglements, I hope to honor, center, and extend maps clues to diasporic indigenous kinship of embodied memory still sturdy, still sure, through centuries of devastation and separation. This is what persists through loss, through the impossibility of origins, what we surely cannot afford to miss. Extractivism. In 1995, I was a student in the UK when the shocking news came of the execution of writer and environmental activist Ken Sarawiwa, who with his community in the Ogoni region had dared to challenge the Nigerian state and shell oil. I had no idea at the time that four years later, the government of Guyana would issue a petroleum exploration license to ExxonMobil, that a quarter of a century later, Exxon would commence commercial production 120 miles in offshore Atlantic waters, that by 2025, these wells will represent Exxon's largest single source of fuel and carbon emissions in the world from the Gulf of Guinea to the Atlantic South American Caribbean coast. Performance poet Mark Matthews unforgettably described Guyana's coastal residents as a people who live with the Atlantic on top of their heads. Its narrow literal strip is literally six feet below sea level, a subterranean geography that offers the constant watery companionship of ancestors. And actually that image behind me is my map of coastal Guyana um, the coker um, portrayed there essential to keeping the water off of the land. Map opens in the village of Guayaguayare, 
Where the sea came to rest is one translation I find that says it took its indigenous name from the sounds of the Atlantic. Guayaguayare is apparently the first land sighted by Christopher Columbus in 1498 in what would become Trinidad and Tobago. Its bay is where I read that enslaved Africans were put to labor by the French fleeing the Haitian Revolution. Guayaguayare, map tells us, is a fishing village at the edge of an ocean that brought quote, the whole of Guayaguayare from unknown places, unknown origins, end quote. It sits on the southern edge of Mayaro, Rio Claro, a municipality whose residents' faces bear ancestral traces of post-emancipation indentured journeys. But Guayaguayare is also where the first commercially viable oil wells would be drilled in Trinidad at the turn of the 20th century. It is where petroleum refining takes place. Its port on the Atlantic coast of this sleepy fishing village is controlled by the main oil producers. Oil and water don't mix. Plantation societies, monocrop geographies, mining and fossil fuel economies, settler colonies, extractivist legacies, violent transnational itineraries of racial capitalism come in new forms of production and circulation, but these shapeshifters of plunder are not strange to us. We have been here before. Elisions, not extinction. Awakening at 4.45 a.m. in a city somewhere, Brand quotes Eduardo Galeano, I'm nostalgic for a country that does not yet exist on a map. Might this have been a place seemingly open to the world, a set of presumptuous black people on a small dot of land in the Eastern Caribbean seas, welcoming, it seemed at the time, revolution time, to all those who arrived from elsewhere, hungry for something else, who turned up, pitched camp, pitched in, with freedom dreams bigger than any passport, any one place, the singular desire to no longer be, quote, constantly overwhelmed by the persistence of the specter of captivity, end quote. It is October. And I'm thinking of Galliano's lines when I turn to Maps 15 pages of October with its heartbreaking question posed to a fellow traveler, Marlene Green, in a cafe on the Danforth 15 years later. What went missing in translation? In my office is a laminated image of Maurice Bishop clasping hands with Samora Michelle, both killed on October 19th, within three years of each other, bloody anniversaries two weeks ago. Forward ever, backward never, the diasporic arc through the door of no return, from Nkrumah's Ghana to Grenada, the confident incantation, at what cost and with what historical amnesia. I always have to steal myself when I come to where Brand speaks of bearing agonized witness to people jumping off the cliff. But we have also been here before, over 300 years earlier, in fact, on the north of the island, Kalinagos also leapt to their deaths to escape capture at the hands of the French. The town's name is Sautez, jumpers, and the cliff is known as Carib's, Carib's Leap. Historian Melanie Newton has shown how this particular historical event unfolded into a narrative of disappearance that served European interests in severing Carib ties to the land, exiling Garifuna people to the mainland and denying Carib African intimacies and exchanges. This narrative took on its own truth, now reproduced and widened into a general theory of indigenous disappearance, of empty lands taken by conquerors, worked by enslaved and indentured diasporics, clearing the space for modernity's imprint. The story brand reminds us that we are told about ourselves from books, from the BBC intruding into Caribbean homes, quote, you have read of islands such as in the Tempest and Treasure Island, described as uninhabited except for monsters and spirits, end quote. When did this become the story we tell about ourselves? The dusty display in the museum at Fort King George in Tobago, the fort that was the site of the 1983 executions in Grenada also returned to the name of King George III. The museum rehearses this genocidal pedagogy that would have us believe that this is all that is left, quote, of millions of journeys, millions of songs, millions of daily acts, millions of memories that no one remembers, end quote. Brand speaks of the ubiquitous occupation of coloniality. But where do we locate acquiescence in these elisions? What price do we pay for these accumulated silences and separations? In an interview with Annie Paul, Stuart Hall offers illuminating insight, quote, the story of repeating what has been done to you, to others you know, of living out through repetition, through mere repetition, rather than in self-consciousness and change, of mimicking it further down the line, 
This should have been tackled at the root, end quote. Enactment. The description of this workshop foregrounds the door as a cognitive schema. What gets opened up by figuring a return that does not stumble on the romance of origins as brand notes in land to light on? And when with Pablo Neruda, one cannot ignore hands stained with garbage and sadness, what might return actually look like distilled into the everyday business of organizing to live? I found Josh Myers' abstract of maps returns helpful as an orientation to justice, one where return materializes, quote, not as recovering things that cannot be recovered, but as recommitting ourselves to living against the world. Brand says the journey is the destination, wayfinding. Journeys compelled by what Audre Lorde identifies as a need for true alteration of the very foundation of our lives. And social activist and I used to say, you can start organizing anywhere at any point, because once you do it right, it will take you to every other point. Ecologies. Exxon's own maps tell us that an oil spill that Exxon's own maps tell us that an oil spill from a well blowout in Guyana's Atlantic waters, wells created by breaking up the seabed and digging two miles below it, could travel across the Eastern Caribbean as well as westward to Jamaica, the Dominican Republic, Haiti, and beyond. Guyana's Atlantic waters, a territorializing adjective whose devastating consequences ripple outwards and upwards a futile designation in the face of planetary catastrophe whose effects are unevenly distributed and whose toxins seep and spread. A possessive claim that serves geopolitical interests in this hemisphere where Venezuelan oil can no longer be counted upon by the powers that be. It is a nationalist conceit that MAP stubbornly refuses. Fishermen and friends of the sea in Trinidad and Tobago describe how the Gulf of Paria between the island and Venezuela, a nursery for fish species, is becoming, quote, the large dustbin of the energy sector, end quote. What lies beyond this archipelago of slick destruction, whose originary principle is disconnection? Brand notes, quote, I have not visited the door of no return, but by relying on random shards of history, I am constructing a map of the region paying attention to faces, to the unknowable, to unintended acts of returning, end quote. And importantly, all that emanates from the door of no return is not dread, but also creativity. Melanie Newton reminds us that the indigenous view of the Lesser Antilles was that it was seen as one, quote, indivisible space made up of sea and land, islands and mainland, end quote. Indivisible in her riotous proliferation of ecology, calling forth radical literacies in the ways in which we story land, not as a commodity to be possessed, mastered, used up, and then discarded, but through our intimate embodied encounters that reveal a dense and sacred web of obligations and caring relations, of knowing, not owning, of the properties of land, not land as property. And I am thinking of the bold presentations last week of activists from Haiti, the Bahamas, Trinidad and Tobago, Guyana, Jamaica, this stubborn gathering of black, indigenous, brown, grassroots women, fisher folk, farmers who met up, connected, strategized, rehearsed, and then collectively testified before the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights on extractive industries and climate justice in the Caribbean. This unprecedented promise of regional voices, gatherings that refuse the destructive, seductive impulse of the nationalist imperative, and its puffed up state managers, extractivism's contemporary overseers. I find a reference that situates Maps Guayaguayare Bay east of the Rio de Iguanas or Lizard River. And Rio de Iguanas leads me in turn to these anagrammatic lines from poet Christian Campbell's Iguana. This excerpt where return is more than just the revolutionization of human relations. It is an invitation to apprehend what Jackie Alexander languages as the sacred intelligence of all living things and our interconnectedness in the face of existential catastrophe. In history, we learned that Lucayans et Iguana, that Caribs, my grandmother's people, et Lucayans, the people of Guanahani, Guyana, the colonial way with an eye southernmost of the Caribbean is Iguana. In Agua, southernmost of the Bahamas, northernmost of the Caribbean is Iguana. Inagua crossroads with Haiti, Inagua of the salt and flamingos. The Spanish called it Inagua. Water is to be found there. Water, water everywhere. 
Guyana, in the language of Arawak's Wayana, land of many waters, is iguana, veins running through land, grooves between green scales. The earth is on the back of an ageless iguana. We are all from the island, land of iguana, Uanora, Carib name for St. Lucia, and all the iguanas scurry away from me, and all the iguanas are dying. Entanglements. For several years, I taught an upper level feminist seminar on the black diaspora. And each time we began the class with the story that Map opens with, the grandfather who does not know whether his people are Yoruba, Igbo, Ashanti, Mandingo, and not knowing that opens a fault line, a rupture, because if there are two things that we are supposed to know, they are that parents are meant to die before their children and that elders always know. Returning to this book for this workshop, it seems completely remarkable to me that I did not ever start that class with the closing pages of Map, another kind of beginning of apprehension, wayfinding. It is so obvious now. I read it today as an invitation, an extended hand that was there all along. A whole world, Dion, in Calabishi, in Charlottesville, in Antigonish, in Granville, in Guayaguayari, and on and on. Quote, the Carib part grateful for its small survival in your, my, our grandfather's face. The African part of my grandfather, perhaps also in gratitude himself to the Kalinago part for sharing with him the knowledge of the islands. My grandfather was an agriculturalist, end quote. Hands deep in the soil. The inescapable embodied entanglement in motion. Thank you, Dion. Thank you. Thank you, Alyssa. Up next to speak is John John Moore. John John Moore is a poet and PhD student in the Department of African American Studies at UC Berkeley. John John studies Black ontology and is trying to figure out what paranormal phenomena tells us about Blackness. His writing has been featured in Drome Magazine, Plowshares, The Often, K Parlay, Critical Humanities and Social Sciences, and more. He has received fellowships from Harvard Hutchins Center, the Center for African Studies at UC Berkeley, and the James C. Hormel LGBTQIA Center of San Francisco Public Library. John John hosts the monthly Black Politics and Culture pub podcast, Abolition Ish is book reviewer at Shade Journal and is the author of the chat book, The Calling. He currently lives in Mexico City and the title of John John's talk today is Black Myopia. John John, please. Thank you, Ronaldo. Uh, before I begin, I must thank um, Christina Sharp who uh, introduced me to Dion Brand's work and Andrea and Marcel Ann and the entire team that has made these amazing conversations possible. And I am so grateful for everyone on this panel. Um, thank you for sharing your work with us. Part one. A few years ago, I had the privilege of getting a tattoo from the performance artist and sculptor Doreen Garner. And when I arrived in New York City for the sole reason to get tattooed by a Black person who cared about Black people and who might actually show my skin on their Instagram in the end, all I had was an idea. There's this book, I told her, and there's this line. I tried to explain how the book comforted and terrified me and how one line in particular would come to me at odd hours in the line at CVS, waiting for the light to turn, waiting to turn over in bed. On page 89 of a map to the door of no return, notes to belonging, Dion Brand writes, it is a return but aptly, it is in the air, and it is a glancing pass at the door of no return. 
The door is not a map. The door is on my retina. I don't remember Doreen's response. And I don't remember if she had read map before. What I do remember is that Doreen took some time to think and sketch. I am everything but a visual person. And, and my original idea, which was an eye, um, and in the iris of that eye, a door, proved really insufficient for what, uh, what we needed to do together. And so after some time, Doreen we, uh, reappeared and she was excited and she proposed, why not put Africa there? Let's put Africa, let's put Africa in the eye. Now, I didn't think the door idea was the sexiest by any means, but the idea of fitting the continent into a visual space the size of a quarter sounded impossible to me. But that's exactly what Doreen did. And maybe that is what Dion Brand did too. Moved the entire continent into the eye. And as Garner gunned the ink into my chest, her decision and Dion Brand's words drowned out the buzz and the blistering pain. Why not show what made the door, I thought. Why not say what I really mean? Or as Dion writes, if I can say it, let me. Two, as I walked out of the studio, my wound still weeping, I came to a few new conclusions. One, I would now purchase copious amounts of V-neck t-shirt to display this gift. And when prompted by strangers with, what does that mean? An opportunity that I cherished then and have certainly come to bemoan, like any person with a marked body, I also realized I needed a quick script. There's this book, I would tell them, by this author. And there's this line, I would tell them, that preyed on my senses while I was eating ice cream and while I was watching the news. And I took it to Doreen Garner in New York City. And for two hours or four hours, as I bled, I thought about the sound of taxis outside and the cruelty of sound, so much you can't think. And for two hours or four hours, I listened to my breathing and I learned things. So maybe I thought I would need an actual script that was actually quick, or maybe I would need variations depending on who was asking the question. But this dilemma was short-lived. This dilemma about what I should or could say about what we had done, about what had already been done, this dilemma was short-lived because before my transparent bandage was even removed, that very same day in a McDonald's somewhere in Brooklyn, a black woman stopped me as I exited and I, I still had a chicken nugget in my mouth. And she goes, that looks like it hurt. And she said, okay, tell me why an I? It is hard to talk about Dion Brand in general, let alone with a mouthful of chicken nugget. So I began elsewhere. I said, look closely, look really, really close. And I tilted my head back so she could see my plastic chest. And she said, you got me fucked up. And I nodded with a pleased smirk as if to say, I fucking know, right? How did she do that? Because perhaps she too had realized how Doreen's skill with shading had somehow moved this centimeter sized continent into the back of the eye, actually realizing this gesture towards the retina. But after five seconds of her staring at my chest in the doorway of this McDonald's, I realized that while the technique, the precision of this image was on the forefront of my mind, her mind was elsewhere. Exactly, she said, nodding and walking away. That's it. And then she put her hands up 
like men do when they win a bet. Or she put her hands up like, thank God, thank God for today. Or she put her hands up. Or I put my hands up. Or I imagine this part. Three. Years later, I visit the optometrist for a new prescription. She tells me about my high myopia. High myopia is an elevated level of nearsightedness. It is common. People with it have longer eyes, which means our retinas are more stretched and this stretching makes it prone to tears. And so the optometrist says, over the next few decades, you should be mindful. You shouldn't forget this. It's not rare, but if you don't know what to look for, you could really get hurt. The retina is a layer of nerve cells at the back of the eyeball. The retina senses light. The retina is a sensory membrane. From here, nerve impulses travel to the optic nerve to the brain where our images come into being. For those with visual sight, the retina is where some sense making begins. It is where some of our worlds begin. Retinal detachment is when the retina pulls away from its supportive tissue. Retinal detachment is a medical emergency. If the relationship between the retina and the blood vessels that provided oxygen and nourishment are not restored within about a day, it's very likely that you could lose some of your vision. People with high myopia, I learn, are at least five times more likely to experience retinal detachment. And so I asked the optometrist later, how would I know that this has happened? How would I know that it is happening? And she tells me I would see things. I would see small specks of stuff that drift around in front of me. I would see bright flashes of light. My vision would become blurry and it would be harder to see what lies on my periphery. On this day, I am not thinking about the door or the hold or where we go when we die. I am not thinking about Africa or America or my name. I am thinking about the 24 hours that the optometrist gives future me, a day to save my sight. I am thinking about the unforgiving run to repair what is not actually broken with really very little reason. I am very afraid. I close my eyes and I see so much. I could mend the gap here and make the meaning. I could tell you a story that made sense that I went home and turned to page 89 of a map and that I sighed with relief. I could tell you a story that made nonsense that I went home and I did the silhouette challenge in the frame of Dion's doorway on Instagram. And everyone sent me lovely compliments like, yes, John, John, you better resist. Or maybe they would say, exactly, you got me fucked up. But the truth is, I did not return to map. Map returned to me. And as I prepared to share with y'all today and celebrate this text, I wanted to figure out how map had lived inside of me over the years. And the best way for me to do this was to write a poem. As Dion so convincingly encourages us to surrender our deference to narrative and just see what happens. To say something, maybe, quote, something about desire, end quote. So now I'll read a brief poem about desire. And when I say that this poem could not exist in a world without Dion Brand, yes. I am speaking of its language and its movements, but I'm also speaking of its knowledge, which is my knowledge now. And that knowledge is a terrible, 
an absolutely justified gift to celebrate. And I'm so happy to celebrate that gift with you all. Thank you, Dion, and thank you all for listening. This will be the last section. Five. If I can say it, let me. Alternate title. All the bars in Oakland. After Dion Brand. The world is a terrible place. And I am paid to keep it. Some days I starve my vision, force detachment and pay the price. I blink and I reap. I eat small and sadistic compromises and underneath my feet and then in the mirror are humane intransigence. On a date, I say to a scientist, I am always in your frame. I whisper to him over my whiskey Coke, there is no you without me. We are a love story without verb. I am romance renewable. On Saturday, I tell the historian, we don't have a ticket. I tell him over dinner, we don't have a chance. There is meat in my teeth. Yes, I am eating a taco, but some hunger, some hunger eats language and leaves the bones rearranged. Thank you all. Thank you, John John. And I think that Warren, Biko, Alyssa, and John John should um, turn your cameras on and return to the stage. Um, as I promised, I'm going to try to stay out of the way, but I did hear some really important resonances across these four papers and poems and poem. And I'm, I'm wondering um, if, if, you, if you guys would like to have a discussion among yourselves um, until the questions come in. Um, um, because I did hear some resonances, the question of walking and wondering these itineraries, how the land shows up in our bodies and how our bodies mark the histories of the land that have been extracted. Um, you know, um, the, 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 the bodies being undone by language, but bodies also being put back together by gestures, by a frown in the face. Um, and, and that very resonant phrase from Alyssa's talk, our bodies tell us something different. And, um, that 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 line, I think, in some ways, really pulled these um, four papers together in a profound way for me. Um, so I don't know if you guys want to say something to each other about um, what you had to say to us today, so beautifully and 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 and, and tellingly. Nothing? Okay, there's, a, there's, there's one question in then. I'm gonna go to the question. <laughs> okay, thank you for these powerful responses. All the presentations bring attention to gestures. So you're back, you're gonna back to this question, you're gonna have to talk to each other. <laughs> All the presentations bring attention to the gestures in map, the walk, the ritual, the glance. I would love to hear any further reflection from the panelists on the subject of the body and the book, especially as they consider one another's offerings today. Thank you again, Sophia Satamata. Um, so there, there you have it. <laughs> More than myself heard it. <laughs> 
I'm laughing because I'm I this is I I'm I'm giddy to like share and like and yeah, I I'm actually gonna like like pull a be petty and point to Alyssa here because I think Alyssa actually has the has like the most profound connections here. Um but I but I'll just say just very briefly that in terms of the body itself for me, I think it was the just the the wandering, the unmaking, and the resonances that I was really sort of tracking even almost to certain citations were between Warren and I. Uh, I think there's a certain way that I'm hearing that misdirection was the way. And I was I was working through that quotation um, in my own work, working through that line and just thinking about how does one, I mean, I, I ended up writing a different paper because wandering, I had to commit to wandering. I had to commit to that walk, that shadow of a man in that video at the end. And, and that that gesture became the possibility for thinking different and thinking anew. And so I think there's a resonance there, at least for me, um, at least with with Warren's work in this particular regard. Um, yeah, I don't know if anyone else saw that resonance or not, or if people are seeing other ones, but yeah. And yeah, but I, I think this is like, Alyssa, I think this is, <laughs> this is for you. Oh no, I was hoping everybody talked until four o'clock, so I had to some questions. <laughs> Um, thank you. I mean, it was amazing because, you know, from John John's opening with the tattoo to the, the way in which the body came through here was, was just so um, beautiful and unexpected. Can you hear me? I think you're, yeah, your mic, something is sitting in your mic. There we go. Okay, now it's good. It's is good it now. okay now? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I was saying, you know, we began with John John's tattoo and so the way the body was threaded through all of the presentations was really beautiful. But what was really unexpected to me indeed was the, the wandering, um, because I really loved your presentation and um, the way in which you, you talked about this refusal of any um, instrumental reason and the way in which you kind of had to humble yourself in the back it's happening again. <laughs> Is it okay now? Uh, Alyssa, yeah. you do, I think you have a piece of paper that's, that's maybe on your keyboard or on your laptop is scratching on the mic. Okay, okay. Yeah. I'm here. Yeah, sorry. I usually take notes <laughs> as a way to anchor myself. I think the, the wandering was really interesting to me as well, starting with um, Leanne Simpson's incredible video that was posted yesterday that then bled into Warren's video of himself walking and invoking at the very same passage, Pinery Road and Concession 11. Mm -hmm. And then Biko, you're walking. I think the ways in which these memories and these practices are held in the body. And for me, as I said, you know, both in Dion's work, and then I stumble upon this incredible paper by Nadine King Chambers, um, which talks about what is held in the body, the way in which memory and love and forms of kinship, um, kinship that have to be created out of impossibility and out of this incredible violence and separation, but this kinship, and then the care of the Pam, hand in the Pam, the grandmother's, um, the granddaughter's hand in her grandmother's palm brings us to the whole question of work and of women's work, of that invisible labor, of the, the, the ritual labor of the old woman sweeping her, her um, bottom house continuously, the sort of when the sun hits her, it captures Kamau's imagination. And it brings us back to that whole question of care. And then the, the face really, you can't escape this question of the impossible entanglement, right? Jackie Alexander asks us, what does it mean to recognize that we have always been neighbors living in, I think she says, the raucous seams of deprivation. I think that's really sort of what I where I where I go with this, and that those are the those are the maps of the body and the maps of the land. There's much more I could say about this, but but I'll just stop for now. Mm -hmm. Warren or John John? You're, you're muted, Warren. Yeah, I was so taken by um, I I'm so struck by this notion of the you know what is extracted gets etched back onto the body, and I thought a lot about this with respect to John John's going into the tattoo and the um, etching you know, of um, <clears throat> Africa into this tiny space, the, the size of a quarter, I think he said, but that it, it enlarges to so much more. And this is really quite striking to me. And it sort of resonates with uh, Alyssa's 
um, telling us about the activists, the women activists that, uh, struggling in the Caribbean around these uh, incredible environmental issues and extraction of oil, the continued uh, colonial exploitation of these places. Um, I think these are really significant resonances uh, uh, across the across the papers that I think connect with my own sense at a at a distance of of walking and encountering things and trying to attend to place, even places that I'm not directly connected to, and 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 yet I've arrived here, and it's the you know, the arrival and departure, the uncertainty of belonging in a place that one continually has to, to make it up in a certain kind of way. Um, and of course, I think this resonates across Dion's work. I'm so interested in reading a map and then uh, uh, going to an autobiography. And we see these connections, even in the blue clerk, uh, these tremendous excursions into, into movements and the body and the remembering of ancestors and what is remembered and what is forgotten and the, the ongoingness of, of trying to navigate or, or make a navigational tool from uh, um, what can be claimed from what uh, is forgotten and what is still available to, to make sense of um, and, you know, as you know, on these journeys, the journeying of it all that becomes so important, not so much the arrival, but the, the continuity of the journey that seems to me to be uh, quite significant. John, John. I guess I'm just thinking about um, what Warren just said about the importance of the continuity of the journey, um, kind of alongside, um, you know, how Dion thinks and is thinking about narrative and poetry and um, what we expect language to do, what we marshal it to do, um, and how, you know, I mean, Maybe it's also alongside this idea of wandering, like, and kind of, you know, nodded to in the title of all the bars in Oakland. I mean, the poem could continue. In fact, maybe I know the poem is going to continue. Um, all of it will continue. Um, my awareness of myself, um, the violence I encounter, uh, the desire that propels me forwards and backwards. Um, and I mean, I think in writing it, I, I, I struggle to um, end it, which is not new. I think we all struggle to end the things we write, but end it in a way that signal to that continuity um, and not necessarily as a positive only, but the whole weight of the continuation, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, John, John, what you said just reminded me of something that Kinesia Lubrin said recently, which is that the poem ends, but it does not stop. And in, in the conversations that, that, that you guys had about wandering, I also, it also evoked for me Langston Hughes, um, wandering and wandering um, and thinking about his own. But there's a question here that, that maybe um, can push this a, a, a bit further. Um, so the, the, the questioner asks, pushing the point, could you say something about the generative force of the thinker of the world as walker, as wanderer that map introduces? I can't think of any other text that does that except maybe Benjamin, Walter Benjamin's. How is it that, how is that in itself a critique of the sitting still philosopher and moreover of the idea of the human that came out of their head, Sabine Brooke? Uh, I'm assuming <laughs> I'll, I'll take a stab at it. I mean, um, part of part of what part of what this text did for me, and I put all my cards on the table. I was trained in philosophy, religion, so I'm trained to develop cognitive schemas. 
Um, I'm just, that's just how uh, I ended up being wired. That's how my, my brain works. But I was reading this text and I found myself constantly trying to find the skeleton key, constantly trying to find that one concept that would unlock everything. The, the you know, Dasein for Heidegger, for example, right? These are the types of things, because that's how I'm trained to think. And every time I thought I had pinned something down, I would find myself sitting in a dazzling contradiction that the speaker had no interest in trying to resolve. Like, like, I mean, the door is real imagined and imaginary. Like, how do you sit in that space? She flies over the door, even as the door is a destination. There, there's, she doesn't arrive there. And then at the end of the, at the end of the text, we end up with that line about a map being a life of conversations about a forgotten list of irretrievable selves. All of the cartographic work that happens in this text for me gets undone there. And so I'm sitting here thinking to myself, this is what philosophy has failed to do, particularly philosophy of religion. We ask the same questions over and over and over again. And in asking those same questions, we exact, we exact and enact a hegemonic violence onto the disciplines to the point where we can't even think productively or ethically or politically because we're still trying to figure out whether or not God exists. But when Yimaya says, so what? There's a different there's a different resonance there. There is an opening, a certain kind of generativity to not to not to not trying to resolve contradictions, but instead sticking with life in its messiness, in its funkiness, in its beauty and its difficulty. And so I think for me, that's where wandering gets the generativity. It is a way in my mind to something like and ethics, something like a, a better ethics than what we have now in philosophy of religion. If I could just add really quickly to, to what Biko said, which was really, um, really wonderful. The only other thing I would probably add thinking about Sabine Brock's question is, you know, that the wanderer in, and, and we had, you know, in the previous panel, we had Bedura Lagra talking about wonder. So wonder and wonder. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really wonderful to hear that coming through in your presentation. Because the only thing I would add is that, you know, the wanderer is also not Baudelaire's flaneur. This is not the independent, rational, autonomous person strolling, strolling through time, strolling across place doing it in a way that is possessive, territorializing and deeply alienating, right? So what we have across maps that I think you pulled out really beautifully is asking ourselves, who do we walk with? And that ritual in the sea in St. Lucia with the invocation of Yamaya is, or the Guyanese who we say we live with the Atlantic Ocean on top of us. Who do we walk with? here in the land around us through our ancestors is actually key. And usually the brightest people for me are my elders. So I got a whole posse of Guyanese online from Guyana writing me <laughs> and answering these questions. And Jocelyn Dow, who is one of the smartest people I know right now said, you know, folks should actually go up and look, go and look up Stanley Graves, who's an incredible Guyanese artist. Um, and, and who has a whole series that is called, um, that, that is called The Shadows Move Among Us. And when we think about shadows, so if you're wandering or walking, right, when we think about those shadows that we carry through us that change depending on the time of day, they're longer, shorter, bigger, smaller. Um, it, it, it's really, it offers a different kind of um, cognitive schema drawing from our own realities um, to engage these questions. So thank you, Auntie Justin, for that answer, which is much better than anything I could have said. Can I just and I just want to add like the who you wander with. I love that because there's a scene that like actually un, unraveled me and I will be we're coming up on time. It's just the kids in town. I don't know if you all remember that part in the text. It's these three kids and then town becomes capitalized because she can't and, and it's like and it's this just this beautiful oh my goodness it's someone's calling me right now. But anyway, uh, it's this beautiful just opening and generative like generative space of unknowing, but still she wants to be with these kids. And there's something about the, how, that, how that pans out that made me think about being with, who do you wander with? Who do you bring along with you? So, yes. Mm -hmm. And also uh, in, that, in that moment, the um, productive nature of being dumbfounded and to be put in a quandary <laughs> as one wanders. Uh, but to see that not as something that needs to be mastered, uh, but to be engaged as a 
you know, as, a, as another point of departure to, to knowing something else, to some other kind of possibility. I think this moment, uh, you use the word, um, the way the text undoes you or undoes your plan. I mean, <laughs> that's a moment in the text that always undoes me, I think. And I, you know, and I, I want to be, or I am dumbfounded, you know, and maybe that's part of what I'm trying to think about with that shadow um, and particularly the way it vanishes in the end to nothing but the sound of footsteps. Do you want to say anything, John, John, or should we, there, there, there are a number of questions and engagements in the Q&A, but we wouldn't get to all of them. So I'm wondering if the panelists want to um, say anything further, any last comments before I make two quick announcements about what's coming up next in the program. I can, I can share a final comment. Um, Go ahead. Uh, not, and some of these folks were there not too long ago, you know, we had um, scenes at 20 to celebrate Saidiya Hartman scenes of subjection. And I think it was Jared Sexton, but I may be wrong, um, said something on the lines of, for him, what scenes did was help him realize that freedom isn't the only thing that we wanted, right? Freedom might not be the only thing we want. And I think that's a fun way to think about our relationship to a map. Um, like for me, I think it's like, it helped me realize that as a black person, but also as a writer, resolution isn't the only thing that I want, right? Relief isn't the only thing that I want. Certainty isn't the only thing that I want. Um, and to not say that apologetically, but to really just believe it and see what happens. Mm -hmm. okay. Anyone else? Okay, well, we've got about just, a minute. I just so. want to thank uh, Elisa for bringing um, Christian Campbell's uh, poem into this. And uh, it, it's such a beautiful, Tongues of the Ocean, it's such a beautiful way to also try to, to think about this and, and also um, connects in a certain way with John John's poem as well. Mm -hmm. I just said, I got a text from Anna Ford Smith who tells me that Ligony in Jamaica might also be some versioning of Iguana as well. So yeah, it's, thank you, Christian, for that. So I apologize for all the questions that we can't get to, but ending on, on, on a discussion of, of Christian Campbell's poem is probably um, a marker of what's to come later this evening. So at 5 p.m. Eastern time to 5.45 p.m., we have the radio play, Dwellers at the Door, that draws from the map of no return by A.K. Payne, Clark Burnett, and Whitney Andrews in conversation with Shaughnessy Brown. And then from 6 to 7 p.m. tonight, we have a musical performance with an introduction by I.J. Ebley from the Improvisation Center at Guelph, but music, um, musical performance by B.J. Iyer and Wadada Leo Smith again in honor of this book, The Map to the Door of No Return. Thank you for those wonderful thought-provoking presentations on Dion Brand's Map to the Door of No Return. Thank you to the audience. And once again, thank you to the folks who asked questions and, uh, and apologies that we were able to get to them. And see you back here at 5 p.m. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye.